it's, it's, a, it's a very big day for me today. It's a year since I had my second heart attack, which was the 11th time I should have lost my life. I have no idea why I have been spared, but I have been. My life has taken many paths. It's a very rich tapestry, which I will share with you because Suzanne said I must tell you about myself. And as I said to her this morning, beware of what you wish for. <laughs> but it's a big, big day for two reasons. In the Sunday Tribune this morning, there's a double-page spread about Brian's Art SA, which is the company that Jenny and I have formed to sell easels, to sell bags, and to sell art cleaning materials, and hopefully my art. It is also the first time that anybody has ever asked me to speak in front of a group about my work. So I'm exceptionally grateful. A year ago, I was in a very, very bad place. I was living in an environment that I can only describe as quite cruel which I thought was going to be a place of great <coughs> harmony for me. And I had this heart attack, and I survived it. I had a BP of uh, 236 over 147. Yep. It was my second one, because the first heart attack happened on August the 29th, 2012. That was the first heart attack which was the fourth time in four years that I was in ICU for four different reasons in four different provinces in this country. <laughs> and intermingled with that, I was attacked in my home, tasered, had my teeth kicked out and my ribs kicked in and tied up and left to die with a strangling device around my neck. But I'm a tough old bugger and I got out of that and I survived it. Now, in this place of mine, I had, the heart attack was actually as a result of, I believe, it brought to a thing, an attempted hijacking in February of last year, in which I tried to slug my way out of it. And I remember punching the one guy clean out of my car, onto the back and down a bench, and, but down a bank, and he came back. Because what was he full of? Wonga, I think they call it. And he bit my cell phone out of my hand. And I, uh, my family were absolutely insistent that I go into ARVs, which I did. Two weeks later, I wrote a letter uh, on Facebook <coughs> saying goodbye to everybody. Now, I do not write, remember writing this letter. I don't remember writing it at all. I went into a completely dissociative state. I've heard of the dissociative state. I don't know anything about it, but I was up there, and I was looking down on me. The cruel people who were my minders sent for an ambulance to take me to a psychiatric hospital. It was with great fortune that my childhood friend, Michelle Przeski, who came to my rescue and She's about that high. She's an ex-nurse, and she gave everybody what for. And she took me off to a doctor, and I slowly came out, at, out of this dissociative state, and they changed the ARV medication, which is one reason now I understand why so many people in this country who are poor, who are uneducated, who don't know why they go off the ARVs. It was sheer hell. Even the new medication was incredible hell. The depressions, the whatever. And I think it just ran me down that last bit. <coughs> and I was in a very depressed state, and I had the heart attack. I felt like, I described it to Robbie the other day. Do you know when you see a, a junkyard shot, when they've taken a car and they've compressed it into this metal thing, that you can see the car, 
You know it's a car, but it's going nowhere. And that's where I was. But you know, what Michelle did for me on my heart attack and, and, and on the ALV story, in life, we, we are desperate to fight for lives. Because that's, I was in the big black hole, and it's the third time I've been there. Third time I thought, it's not worth carrying on. And it took kindness, the elixir of kindness to drop somewhere on whatever that was. And slowly these two little flowers metaphorically started to grow from me. And I said, I'm not going to let this get the better of me. I am going to get out of here. I am going to make something happen. And then I met this wonderful woman. And we had this instant connection. It is as if we have been in another life. Now, I, I don't know whether we have other lives or whatever, but it's like we know each other. And you know what? In my typical way, I said, Ginny, all I've got to give you is my two flowers that are growing here, my metaphorical flowers. And she turned to me in one of the very first lessons she taught me, and there have been many more. She said, no, those are your flowers. And how can I not look at you the beauty of your flowers growing with you. But she said, you know what I've got, metaphorically speaking. She said, I've got years and years and years of seeds that I've been looking for a place to plant. <sighs> Sorry, I'm a bit emotional about this. And she said, can I come and plant my seeds in your little garden? And we did that. And today, we are gardeners. We're gardening our happiness together and growing each other. And we've been through some very tough times this year. Johnny's been subject to fraud um, and all those things. But all we find is happiness every time we get. So that is my state of mind a year later. Because a few weeks ago, I went to go and see a doctor. And I don't really like doctors. <laughs> but this doctor was nice. He was a really nice guy. Fine, he says, okay, doof, 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 and he puts me through the test. He says, come back, blood test tomorrow, this, that, that. Phone me up in the afternoon. He says, I want to tell you that you are perfect. You are 100%. Everything is under control. You are, they did everything. You're in one. And that same day, that very same day, I got a message from Facebook from a professor that I met on LinkedIn through my work in trauma, and become friends with on Facebook. I've never met him. And his name's Walter. And Walter said to me, I need to make an observation. Your creative posts of today have such power, far more power than the string of your trauma posts on Facebook in the past. There's a great lesson in that. And that uh, this projection of mine that goes forward. Now, I am in a very happy space. I'm a gardener. I'm an artist. I'm a, in love. I have just everything going. I'm in an incredibly happy space. And then I'm brought back to at trauma activist. And that's a difficult place for me to be. So I'm going to plunge in further and tell you that the reason I've come to see you today is to tell you about a solution that I, am put, or I want to put on the table. The Trauma and Resilience Informed Solutions Institute of Southern Africa. Now, in going through this, I'm going to take you through the journey that I went in discovering it, why I came up with this idea. And I have to tell you that I'm going to tell you things that are going to shock you. You are not all going to believe everything that I have to say. But you see, I've worked through many tunnels on this journey. Beautiful tunnels, scary tunnels, hope tunnels, squeezing tunnels. And out of that have only appeared my interpretation, okay? This is through my eye. But I'm going to put some facts on the table for you. And I have to warn you that I am not politically correct. I'm not PC. If I say something, it's PC. It's because I've chosen to. 
I'm actually virulently against the whole concept of being politically correct. I believe it is more dictatorial than the greatest dictators that the world has ever had because it stops me saying what I need to say. It stops me exploring both the yin and the yang of everything. So I have this very strong feeling about it. I do not like people who call themselves empathetic <laughs> because my argument is that empathetic people come there with their view of empathy, not of what I need. And they come and they say, oh, I'm so empathetic, and tomorrow they are gone. And I actually had a long, this is where I met Walter, actually, a long online debate on the, with the guy on LinkedIn who's sp supposed to be the world's top guy on empathy. And he climbed into me. He gave, gave me hell. And then the post started coming from other people saying, well, how can you be empathetic if you can't listen to Brian's point of view? How can you be empathetic? It was a very interesting thing. So I, I, I don't. I don't like people who tell me, say, Oh, you can't walk in their shoes. You can't, you, if you've not walked in their shoes. Let me tell you, where I've been, I do not want you to walk in my shoes. They're smelly. They're old. They've got my holes in them. Your feet aren't going to go there. And how do I know you're not going to put lice in my shoes anyway? So I don't like people who say that. So I'm not PC, okay? All right? So if I say some stuff, and I know there's some stuff that's going to shock you, it's only because I really believe it, and I really believe that the knowledge has to get out there. My inspiration for my work, on the 31st of August, I had my first heart attack on the 29th. On the 31st of August, I was in ICU, and I decided that that being the 10th time I had nearly lost my life, and it was very close. I could only move my foot when the paramedics got there. I had three stents put in, one of which was a double. Three arteries had collapsed completely, and one was barely working. I had a wonderful, wonderful surgeon. Most blessed. <coughs> um, and I decided that I would not love, live to be 60. Now, I'm telling you, I'm going to be 60 in three weeks' time. I decided then and then, uh, there was no way. There was no way. What I'd been through, I could not live to be 60. And I threw myself into understanding, trying to understand trauma and from my journey. And I found this very, very inspirational. Now, I'm, I'm sure you can't all read it, but it's the Minister of Health, Aaron Mozzoletti. I don't know how long he's going to be the Minister of Health for, because he has uh, spoken up against our president. But from everything that I have learned about this man, I just wish he'd had an easier ride in our health care, and that he did not have so many challenges. But he said he wanted greater awareness, better planning, and a move away from the hospice-centric approach to the treatment of mental illness. That is what the rest of the world wants. And yet, and yet, our medical establishment attacked him for this. He said, we must examine how mental health can be integrated into general health care and particularly into primary health care. Now, I know that there's one man sitting there, right there, who is in tune with me, and I don't know any of you. I just hope our ecologies come together somehow on this. But uh, the body... The body is everything. The mind is just a consequence of the body. Since being with Ginny, when I, when I first moved in with Ginny Jalaha, I weighed 96.5 kgs. I could not walk around the three-acre property. I can tell you that I now feel as fit as I was when I was 40 and probably better. And I have lost... What? I'm 83.6 kilos or something this morning. And I haven't had a special diet. It is because my body is doing things. It is in harmony. It is great. And my mind is now clear. And I think Mr. Mozzoletti was dead right. He then said another thing. Because of their condition, mental health care, health care users are often voiceless. Damn right we are. Damn right we are. There is no, no place to go. Nothing. Because I will take you through the two big organizations, SADAG and uh, South Oregon Mental Health Organization. They put themselves out as advocates of uh, mental health care. But you try and speak through them. Not a chance. They control everything. 
They're in absolute control of the marketplace. The psychiatrist, the psychologist, the thing. They are the control. <coughs> and he said, it's critical we both give this group the space to voice their needs. Thank you for giving me my space today, Suzanne. The other important thing that I learned, and this was right at the end of, actually after I'd written Trissy, which I completed in November of last year. I read this from a sixth year, a sixth year medical student. And you can probably help me, because I don't know Nolon Wabo is a girl's or a boy's name. It's a girl's name. I suspected it was, but I didn't want to get it wrong. She wrote in the South African Journal of Bioethics and Law, and I praise them for, put, for putting this here. The issue of quality health care has, has been debated to its ultimate exhaustion. And it has been deliberated beyond a conceivable alternative to its status quo. Damn right. You know, Mutsaledi said that at the, at the September 12 uh, uh, gathering, and they've signed the Ikorileni Declaration that did that. Has anybody stepped up to do make, you give a solution to what do you think? Not one organization, not one person. I want to get to the Minister of Health because I've got a solution, at least. I may be wrong, but I've got a solution. But he goes on to say, but at what point do we begin to be silent about pertinent issues, especially those affecting the livelihood of a whole nation? Quite right. Is it safe to say that we should be completely resigned to the current state of our healthcare system and merely make us with, do with a few resources available to us? Not at all. That is why I'm going to continue to fight. And in my space as trauma activist, I'm a bit of a honey badger, I'm afraid. When I'm in the corner, I'm not so lacquer. Okay. Very early on, I, 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 I don't know why I wrote this down. I knew nothing about where I was going. Unresolved trauma is the fuel for the cycle of violence in South Africa today. Are you agreeing? I didn't know where I was coming. You know, my, you, I had knew nothing. I was just a bloke who thought he was going to die and I needed to do something. And I wrote that statement down. But I had... Uh, once upon a time in my life, I was quite a good statistician. So I took the statistical reasoning of the null hypothesis. In other words, I wanted to prove that wrong. If I could prove, I, I could prove that that did not exist to myself, then, then um, it was the best way. Not to prove that it existed, but to prove that it was. And this is my journey. You will see along the way lots of B photographs because we cannot survive in this world without the bee. It is the symbol of everything. You know that. What The world will shut down in two years' time if all the bees die. People like Monsanto are trying to, trying to kill them at all times. Oh, by the way, look, I'm an activist in many other different ways as well. I mean, uh, I, uh, 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 we're trying to grab the, all this great big organic veggie garden that we're trying to start at home so as well, so it's physically. So here's my first non-PC statement, okay? That's me. There I am. That's 70 odd blokes, one parachute battalion, A company, in January of 1975. I don't think there's a, I think he's the oldest, I think he's 20. I was 18. I will not apologize for being a soldier in the SADF. I will not apologize for being a paratrooper in the SADF. I was just a boy and I went off to war and I wanted to be something that I was proud of. I didn't want to just be something of what, so I joined the paratroopers and I went through their tough selection courses and I was very proud to do that. And to this day, I'm exceptionally grateful that I chose that route. And I'll tell you two reasons why. I spent 10 years doing two or three months on behalf of the SADF with paratroop with 44 Brigade. They didn't call us up to go and stand guard. They called us up for operations and I saw action in four different countries. I never once, never once saw a fellow paratrooper act mor morally indefensibly. Never once. I never even heard about one doing it. We were the better trained. We were the best people. We were the people that they wanted to not behave incorrectly. We were also trained to be disciplined soldiers. One of my traumas comes from the fact 
not just for what happened when we were, when we were on the ground or in the air. But when I got my call up, because we were going into action, they would send you a call up only seven days before. Boom. And then I would go through a process of seven days of changing myself from my civilian life into my army life until I put those browns on and I took the train. But that wasn't the hard part because I knew they were going to take me for a week. They were going to retrain me. They were going to make sure that I was whatever. I knew that and I trusted them. The paratrooper brotherhood is like nothing you could ever, ever believe to understand. Today we are very close. Those guys, we all have a WhatsApp group and we share and we look after each other. And it's a brotherhood that uh, I took that brotherhood into the working world expecting that people would be like that. But they don't. They stab you in the back. They kick you in the nuts. They do whatever they want you to do in the business life. People are cruel. That bunch of guys are not. Not within themselves. Every one of them says the same thing. They were absolutely shocked at the outside world. Didn't treat each other like it did. So <coughs> the problem was coming home. We would finish what we were doing. They'd put us on a plane back to Pretoria and put us on a train and go home. And I had that train journey to transform myself from what I had just been doing into a loving son, a loving husband later on, a loving dad. And I couldn't do it. I broke up two trains, I can tell you that. I smashed them up. Smashed them up, along with others. Just couldn't get there. Jumped the trains and found my way home. MPs are still looking for me. Anyway. Okay, so that's where I started with PTSD for soldiers. So that's where I started. And I started my search and I worked through all of that. And then as I was working through, I realized, of course, that it wasn't just soldiers. It was policemen, doctors, firemen, and um, these chaps here. Do you know that people on 911 calls are incredibly susceptible to post-traumatic stress disorder? Incredibly. Incredibly. Now, I don't know. Would any of you like to take a guess? In the U.S. military, that wonderful country that hasn't not been at war since 1757 with somebody. <coughs> <coughs> do you know what? Do you know the great, which military profession would you think? Special forces, Green Berets, CIA, whatever, whatever. The greatest trauma. Anybody would like to venture a great your guess? Those boys. They have a 72% dropout rate. These people kill by remote control. And their nightmares are horrendous. They won't admit this, but it's coming out, coming out, coming out. Listen, places I go on the internet, believe me, they, they're called underground places because these guys get prosecuted for talking. Well. But of course, all I've shown you is pictures of men because it suddenly dawned on me that this might affect women as well. Do you know how difficult it is to get pictures of black women, doctors, black women, nurse, um, 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 firefighters and whatever, whatever? I searched for them. Google. I don't know what Google does. I put in, I want a black, fire, black woman firefighter. They send me a woman with black on her face. <laughs> so I apologize. Okay? Right. And of course I learned that there was women. Now that scared the hell out of me because now I've got to try and think about women and whatever as well. This is going far beyond me. And I started at that point in time trying to do something about putting groups together. And I came up with this concept of road walker, buddy care. You can find my buddy care website. It's been dormant for some time now because I'm, I'm afraid I reached a point when I helped a suicide in Canada, ex-military man, over a period of 18 hours and talked him out of killing himself and finding out why he was killing himself. Of course, he had been subscribed medication that was uh, uh, side effects. Uh, side effects were, all of them were suicide. So he didn't know whether to take, he was telling me he didn't know whether to take the pills or shoot himself, which one it was, and I, whatever. And um, I then fortunately have some information about 
medications. And I pointed this out to him and I saved his life, but it, it cracked me. I, I'm not cut out for it because I, I too have got too much in my life. But this is the idea that I put up and it's still out there if somebody wants to pick it up. And it says, I am your road walker. I don't have to be a psychologist, psychiatrist, whatever. I'm just your friend. I'm your road walker. I walk just behind you. I cannot walk your journey for you. But if you ask, I will step up and walk beside you for as long as you wish and as long as I can. And I can tell you that today, that when people get in touch with me, that's the first thing I send them. And very often they say, thank you, that's enough. Just to know that somebody is there when I need them. So, that was the first part of my journey that I'd got to in this body care stuff. But I'm still studying. I'm still trying to find out. And then I looked at the depth of trauma and how far. And I learned a lot of this thing. That says you can't read it. Fuck historical trauma. We survived all and every act of genocide. I learned about historical trauma. I learned about community trauma. I learned about cultural trauma. I learned about witnessing trauma, which I will get to shortly. I learned about moral injury. I learned about betrayal trauma. Have you heard of these concepts? Every one of them is intensely written about. This thing says, yeah, and this is what I went through in, over a year ago. The saddest thing about betrayal is it never comes from your enemies. It comes from your friends. So I will just talk to you about witnessing. There's only been only one study ever done of any magnitude in South Africa about PTSD. It's about 4,700 people. That was about all it is. But the most, the most important thing that came out of it, peace, I think I'm losing my, lost my battery here. Witnessing, 50% of people within their, within their scope, the trauma had come from witnessing events. Now think about it. Think about those townships. Think about those kids and what they see every day. It's daily. Think about those farming communities. What they see and they hear from each other. Witnessing is one of the worst things. You know, um, uh, anybody heard about critical incident stress debriefing? Anybody practice it? Don't. Don't. Because critical incident stress debriefing was brought to the world as this wonderful thing to do immediately after an event. And it involves sharing your experiences when you are vulnerable. And this prefrontal cortex is far more powerful than our amphibious brain. So people who had not seen the head go through the window, oh, check, you all know, you're all thinking about a head flying through the window, right? suddenly imagined that they'd seen the head, and the impact of that is far worse. Far, far worse. One of my dreams, and it's not really in this place, I had to slip it in somewhere, is to start psychological first aid in South Africa. Psychological first aid was introduced in 2002 by the Australian Red Cross. The Americans then pumped a lot of money into it, and you can train online. I qualified online for nothing. You just pretend you're an American. It's easy. <laughs> I lived in Washington. <laughs> um, and I'm certificated and everything. And I put together something in Cape Town and I put some psychologists and some social workers and some teachers and whatever. And we did the whole course then again together and then we put another whole course. But my life went off track. So I, I never got to take it further. But here's an interesting thing. I don't know what it is. At the beginning of this year, I said to Jenny, Jenny, this year, I'm not going to swim against the tide anymore. I'm not. I'm not. If the tide wants to take me, that's where it'll take me. Now, this has happened to me. That art thing's happened to me. I didn't ask for that. I did a presentation to a group of artists like yours. This is my easels and whatever. And Liz Clark, the journalist, came out and said, hey, 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 I'm putting you in the newspaper. Here we go. I was adjoined to a group, and I didn't know why. I joined to a group on WhatsApp of people who are working to do something about the terrible farm murder situations in this country. Right. I didn't know. But guess where I've been guided? They want me to bring psychological first aid into the program. 
it's, life is strange. What I did learn is that these boys, my mates, who I talk to every day there, that's Prusky there. He's got a big nose and the ladies love him. Ah! <coughs> ah, he's a wonderful chap. But all of these guys, as I explained to him, and sadly some of them are no longer with us, but suffered moral injury of war. It was the morality aspect. Because most of these guys, they might be boilermakers, they might be, some of them are scientists, some of them are all sorts of different things, but they all had one common thing. There was a, they did pick you to make sure that you had a moral conscience of what went on and how it was. And all of them also feel a sense of betrayal. Because that group of people were sent in in 1975. 18 years old I was. And they put me in a tent. And they told, me, told us that they were going to send us on a special mission. And, but we can only take volunteers. Now I've been training, I've been doing this, I'm, I'm so pumped up, my mate. Of course we're going to volunteer. So we go through into the second tent where they stripped us of our South African uniforms, took away our favorite weapon, which is a folding butt FN, special for paratroopers. They issued us with prison greens, some tackies, a West German FN, and they took everything. I hit my son Christopher under my tongue. Wouldn't take that away from me. They wouldn't even let us take our dog tags, but most of us took them. Because you know, dog tags are very important for a soldier. Because if he gets shot or blown to smithereens, at least you can find his dog tag. At least you know where he is. <coughs> and they sent us in, along with about two and a half thousand other people. But it was the paratroopers and the armored car guys who saw most of the action and, and, and of course, one reconnaissance battalion. And we came out of there four months later. And we might look happy there, but I'm telling you, we are damn happy because we're safe. We were shattered. And then we found out all the time we'd been sent in there as mercenaries, that the South African government had disowned us. Because I know five guys who were taken captive by the Cubans and they refused to negotiate. We were betrayed. We were betrayed not only by the Southern government, we were betrayed by the CIA as well, because the CIA organized all of that. And believe me, we've got the proof. Because we work, there's guys who work very hard on this. And in fact, the CIA owe me $9,000 because they offered to pay, pay me. But the Southern government doesn't. So there's a guy who's actually who's fighting it. He's fighting the case that each of us will get $9,000. Why not? I then discovered this amazing thing. How many of you know about ACEs? Adverse childhood experiences. Ah, quite a few, hey? I'm glad to hear that because I'm not seeing any organization in South Africa that's following up on adverse childhood experiences. We, we talk about, um, what's the, um, oh, slipped my mind. Early childhood education, early childhood development. But if, unless you pin the ACEs study, which has been done, what, 140 research times across 80 different countries and whatever and whatever, unless you pin that information and prove to be the same in all, basically, everywhere, unless you prove that, <coughs> unless you integrate that, you will never solve early childhood development. You have to integrate that. Now, I know for those of you who don't know, I, I'm, gonna, I'm no great name dropper, but it, the Kaiser Permanente, Dr. Oh, I don't know what his name is. There was a, a doctor, he's got a strange sort of Italian name, and he was treating obesity. And he discovered that 80% by chance, because he then started to do a little survey, started to think 80% of the people that he was treating for obesity, the cause of their obesity was trauma. And that if you remove the trauma, if you, if you dealt with the trauma, these people automatically lost weight. Here I am, 13 kilos lighter. Here I am. <coughs> and so they did the Kaiser Permanente, Kaiser Permanente did the study. Seven, first study, 17 and a half thousand people. They bill it as the largest study ever done. I'm going to disprove that. But they did it amongst middle class Americans. Sort of every common Joe still trying to pay the bills, trying to be not rich, not poor, whatever, but just muddling along. And they came up with this amazing set of information. And as I say, it's been repeated and repeated and repeated, and it's scientifically absolutely and utterly, unlike, unlike many of the, our, our, our psychologies, like, I'm sorry, um, I'm not very PC. Um, 
Anyway, I'll get to that just now. Um, advanced, adverse childhood experiences. The very, very first thing, adverse childhood experiences, is disrupted neurodevelopment. Anybody know the work of Bruce Perry? Magnificent. Read him. Read him. If you're in education in any kind of a way, read Bruce Perry. Unbelievable. He's the man who's really at the heart of it. He's one of these wonderful people like Bessel van der Kolk. It is Bruce Perry's name, but he uses, he shares, other people share with him, and he's like the hub. So how the hell can our poor children in our poor areas develop? Because it's an absolute fact. They can't learn. They have an impaired learning situation because they are traumatized. They can't. And then, bloody teenagers, we talk about social, emotional, and cognitive impairment. Yeah. The adoption of health risk behaviors, promiscuity, drugs, you know, that's where you want to cure the HIV situation, you, you've got to de deal with ACEs. Because where does HIV come from? Either promiscuity or a desperate desire to get out of poverty. And all driven by trauma. This says uh, disease, disability, and social problems. Well, uh, there's, you know, when I had my first heart attack, Dr. Darwood down in Cape Town, what a great guy. You could really talk to him. And he, and he said, but there's nothing. I can't find anything wrong with you. You've got no cholesterol. You've got nothing. You've got nothing. You've got nothing. Eventually, we came to the conclusion it was because I de-stressed when I'd gone to Cape Town. And I'd been living at such a high stress level that that's what actually brought the heart attack on because my body was at the high stress levels. It was still pumping through those, those, those arteries. But the fact of the matter is, okay, I then went on to lose seven inches of my colon and half my bowel. And I'd been to see a doctor, and uh, I, I, I had a problem called diverticulitis, stress-related, if you know diverticulitis, diverticulitis, whatever you want to pronounce it. <coughs> so I had this problem. And I said to him, it's diverticulitis. And he said to me, no, 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 you've just pulled a muscle. Well, that night, I, I started to get the cold sweats and whatever, and uh, whatever, and I got myself into, into the hospital. I went to see him, and I said, listen. They said, oh, well, I'll send you down, down to do a scan. I went to go and get the scan done. And they took a look at this white guy, I mean, wh white guy, okay, and they said, okay, quickly do it and go and have a cup of coffee, came back. I walked in to do it and I hit the deck. My stum tire stomach burst. If it hadn't happened in the hospital, I reckon, if it had happened at home, I would have two hours to, to have lived. I lost everything. The pain, oh, I've got flu at the moment, half, thank you. I've got flu at the moment, and I've told Jenny it's worse than childbirth. She does not, <laughs> she does not believe me. I'm telling you that was worse than childbirth, it really was. And the other thing is early death. That's what adverse childhood experiences bring to you. They, they, they put it into three categories. This is what they found out, which was absolutely amazed me. On the left, we have abuse. Physical abuse, emotional abuse, and sexual abuse. Okay? But I'm going to get to why it amazes me. Neglect. Neglect is one of the greatest causes of trauma for our children. These mothers who have to go out and work, and they leave their children behind. We know this. We've got this terrible situation. Those people who work in social work who try and, 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 and solve these problems, I've met some wonderful people because there's dignity in work. There's dignity in being able to, but mothers can't go out because they can't leave their children. Physical and emotional neglect. Household dysfunction, mental illness, incarcerated relatives, Mother treated uh, violently, witnessing the mother treated violently. Well, I like that one, but I'll come back to that. What about the father being treated violently? You know, I went to see another doctor, and I was telling him about the situation, whatever. And he said to me, do you know, do you know that doctor down there? And he said, I said yeah, and he's, he's six foot seven. He said he's married to a five foot two woman. This woman beats him up regularly. She'll walk behind him and smash a bottle over his head. I'm coming to that. I'm coming to that. <laughs> Substance abuse and divorce, Okay. But this is, this is where it all comes, and you, uh, we can't really see it on these things. But they've scaled it, okay? Here, I'm going to take you to the last one. The most, the prevalence of individual ACEs, 28%. Now, there are 10 ACEs, right? If you have four of those ACEs, you're going to have problems. Your chances of having problems are huge. If you've got six, you're definitely going to have problems. So that's what makes me cry. His score is four. 
Without intervention, he is 4.7 times as likely to, more likely, as likely, and seven, four times as likely to be an alcoholic when he grows up. Unless we integrate the whole ACEs thinking into our early childhood development, we have no chance of, 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 of solving it. And the most incredible part is there are models. There are everything. People have done the most amazing work. They're available to us free on a plate, I promise you. Free. We can use them for free. These people will share them for nothing because that's the beautiful world of ACEs. It's, it, it hasn't, it's not controlled by the psychologists. Not contro only psychologists and psychiatrists in this room, by the way. Oh, I'm hell of a sorry. I know they're Rob or whatever. I, I, it's not personal, okay? It's just, it's just a thing, okay? And they're not controlled by these people. They're controlled by social workers. And by a social worker, it can be a psychiatrist or a psychologist or simply a volunteer. Those are the people I admire in this world. But our juvenile justice system, our health care, our courts, our early interventions, our schools, our child care, our home visiting, our child welfare, all of those things are affected by this. And the, the costs are skyrocketing. Right. Time to take another breath. I'm going to take some water because I'm about to hit you with some facts. If you haven't heard this, I know Suzanne might have shared some of these with you, but I'm about to hit, hit you with some facts about South Africa that are really quite shocking. Why these studies aren't broadcast far and wide, I don't know. But perchance, after I'd finished writing Trissy, I ran across this incredible study. Optimist study for South, uh, Optimist study South Africa technical report you can Google it Optimist study, and you can download it. It was published in May 2016. It's about sexual victimization of children in South Africa. Just sexual. Just sexual victimization. I don't know what's going to be done about this study. I've got a feeling it's another one of those studies that is going to be done and nothing's going to happen. That's why I want to Trissy, okay, which I'm going to get to. But they're going to tell us some stuff here that is going to shock you. So your results revealed that of the young people interviewed in schools, 35.4%, and this study was over 250,000 strong. Unfortunately, the Optimist study is not well written up on the basis of its sample size. Okay? So I can't, and I, and I like to know what my, the sample sizes are. 35%, that's one in every three young people had experienced some form of sexual abuse at some point of their lives. One in three. One in three, sexual abuse. Only sexual abuse out of all those aces. The differences between males and females reported rates of abuse were not as stark as this, in this South African study as there have been in other studies. And except, unfortunately, all the list of the studies that they have done has missed out another one, which I'm going to show you, which is going to shock you. That boys were found to be slightly more likely than girls to report sexual abuse. I'm telling you folks, we have been PC'd into believing that violence against women is the only thing we have to look at. Uh, we will not solve the problem of violence against women until we solve the problem of violence against little boys. Because it is in the male that the hormones are there that take out the reaction then later in life against the women. These <laughs> twisted people it's going to shock you all. I'm going to shock you more. Okay. This is only one of the very few figures that are available to us in this country about quantifying it. They talk about a, a KPMG study that found the economic impact of violence against women in South Africa to be 28.4 billion and 42.4 billion. So let's call that 35 million, billion, right in the middle. And because of violence against boys, let's dump that 70 billion, okay? That's what it costs us. Annually. But they hadn't heard of this study. It was done by Neil Anderson and Ada Foster. They're doing a lot of these studies around the world. They're very well known. It was completely and utterly squashed. The South African journals would not publish it. I've researched this and whatever. They wouldn't because the results are too shocking. Too unbelievable. So the objective was, prior to 2007, forced sex with male children in South Africa did not count as rape, but as indecent assault. You couldn't be raped as a boy. A much less serious offense. And this study sought to document prevalence of male sexual violence among school youth. Now, they are professional, very good. There was a total of 269,000 learners who were, I think this is rather large, this is rather large sample size, I think. 
about half of which were males. Let's just call it like that. Now, here we go. Of those aged 18 years at the time of survey, 44% higher than the Optima study <coughs> said they had been forced to have sex. To have sex. We're not just talking about sexual assault. To have sex. We're talking about boys in their lives. And 50% had reported consensual sex. Perpetrators were most frequently an adult not from their own family, followed closely in frequency by other school children. Some 32% said the perpetrator was male. 41% said she was female. And 27% said they'd been forced to have sex by both male and female perpetrators. And believe me, uh, in my work I've gone through down this, and I, I, hadn't just, I, didn't, I didn't know about the study. It's not interesting. Not know what I wrote. I only learned it later. But the people that I interviewed and the people that think they were telling me this, the very worst case of trauma that I have ever, ever experienced is the most wonderful, beautiful human being. And he has taken me through it. All of that. Male, female, and both. And he comes from an orphanage. He was in an orphanage. And he was traded. And he was traded by the elite in Durban. The elite. I know the names. They had his court case thrown out. But now one of those elite was arrested in the United States for sexual assault on minors. And he wanted to reopen the case, and I can't get anybody to help me. He hasn't got any money. But he needs closure. He needs closure. And he told me of what it's like to come from an orphanage and be traded by the elite of Durban. By the way, what was quite interesting, um, the study also said that in, in, in the more rural areas, uh, male on male uh, sexual assault was more prevalent. But it was much higher female on the, in the cities. I don't know what that means. I don't know. I can't understand it, guys. So now I'm just going to quickly flip through some of my work of things, and you'll see the bees. I'm going to tell you about what's in the chapters. If you want to read my work, it's only 660 pages, 23 chapters, <laughs> 606 scientific and expert references. And my style is, I don't, I do have written forwards to some of it, but my style is, I've taken quotes out of each of the experts to make up a story. That was my style. Okay. And I'm going to tell you about some of the chapters in there, and on this journey and how I've gone. I, I've covered the impact of trauma, and my thing is not doing, but I'll read this out to you. I start with, that's on section five, okay, there are 23 sections. Adverse childhood experiences, intergenerational trauma, woo! Epigenetics. You know that we started to get a lot of information about epigenetics from the Jewish homes. Do you know that the, the, the people who came out of the concentration camps who survived, most of them, were so hardened that they, they somehow managed to live and live with a Victor, what's his name? Victor, Victor Frankel. Frankel, thank you. I mean, you've read, I'm sure you've read about what wonderful writings he's got and he explains why. The next generation, we're not that badly affected. The third generation, bang. Bang. The third generation, it's huge. So along comes a guy, Ed, I didn't into his book, Ed, Ed, Ed. And he's, he's working with American vets who want to go back to Vietnam. And they want to go back to the places that they were at. And they want to go and say sorry, and they want to go and make peace with themselves, whatever it is. And he gets working with these guys, and therefore he starts working with the Vietnamese. And now he's working with the Vietnamese, it's called Soul Repair, his book. And guess what he discovered? The third generation of Vietnamese are completely and utterly traumatized nations. I will say to you folks that we've been living in this country for a lot longer than bloody apartheid. We've been living in this country for 175 years with trauma. I have a friend who, who has collapsed. She's a doctor. Lovely, lovely, lovely lady. She's an Ashoka fellow. She's um, Dr. Nobs and Wanda. She is just absolutely awesome. And she gave up her, her doctor's practice to start something in, in Soweto. And Orlando West. She believes that 
of Orlando West are severely traumatized and absolutely linked to intergenerational trauma. Absolutely linked to intergenerational trauma. Their grandparents raped their children. It, it goes back generations and generations. That isn't because they're black people. It's because of their, what built up and then it gets passed on. It gets passed on from one to the other. Do you know your DNA can change? I mean, people don't know this. Your DNA changes. So the DNA that I was born with, little Brian, who was such a happy little chap, they used to call me fatty. I, that, that, although I was as skinny as a rake, they called me fatty and lived with me till I was about 16. What I have went through, my DNA has so changed, I thank God I can't have children. Thank goodness I can't have children anymore. Can I, Jim? <laughs> <coughs> and there's a whole subsection on trauma and violence in there. The impact of trauma, okay, this is where it started to take me on to, to I learned about communities and how whole communities. You know in the Cape Flats, if you've ever been down there and worked there, anybody from the Cape and know the Cape Flats areas? There are some communities where there is no trauma. It's very, very limited. There are others which are highly traumatized. And I, I, I put a proposal. Oh, wonderful man. He, um, uh, he, he, he tried to make it happen for me. He's been working in social work for his whole life. But in which we could take a community and we could build in programs into that community and make it there. Because what happens and what they find when they do this then other people want to come on and say, hey, but that's so nice, we want this. And then it starts to happen. So you create little modules. You spread them out. It's my, my representation of those beehives. You can't treat the whole community. It's impossible. But if you take bits and bits and bits, and eventually the beehive the, starts to form. Culture, community, culture, okay, cultural competence, historical trauma, cultural competence, very interesting subject to read. Social comp Socio-cultural impacts and socio-economic impacts. So that's all in there. I put some numbers down. Trauma and caregiving. Ah, are you caregivers here? Traumatized caregivers? Holy whack. Holy whack. We can't keep social workers. We can't keep them for longer than three years. They blow out. They've got no support structure. They've got nothing. And these wonderful, beautiful people give so much. And do you know that there's a very much a thing where people deliberately try and inflict trauma on caregivers, but that's the patient. Trauma in the individual, all right. I, I looked at it all from this. Is the, if you want to know it from the beginning, the biological mechanisms of stress and trauma, the brain beyond the brain, good stress, bad stress. We need stress. We don't function without stress. We need some stress. We need to be a bit nervous about things a little bit. It's good. And then there's toxic stress, which is the word that I like to use. I don't, I don't call myself having post-traumatic stress disorder. I, I, I have toxic stress. That's what it is. What is trauma? More than PTSD because uh, and I give the whole history of PTSD and how it evolved and where it evolved. And some, I, I, I'm not knocking the guys who really got in and started PTSD. <coughs> Jonathan Scher. Uh, uh, ah, the name's... Are, Johnson Church, genius. He sent me a I, I was cheeky, I wrote it. And he, and, he, and he sent me his CV. After the fifth page of doctorates, I said, no, I, 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 I can't take any of this all in. He is an absolute genius. He was a neurosurgeon, and uh, he had a heart attack. So he decided he would do something less stressful. So he joined the Veterans Association. As a, he did a quick doctorate, quick doctorate in <laughs> psychology, and he joined the VA. Amazing man. Abs he wrote moral injury. He wrote about moral injury. Fantastic human being. I think he's, he's nearly 90 now. Frank Uchberg is the other one. Is the other one. Fantastic work that they did. And then they, they wanted it to get into the DSM. Do you know what the DSM? Diagnostics and Statistical Manual. That fraud. I'm coming to that. <coughs> okay. And I learned about complex trauma, all the beautiful work about Bessel van der Valk and people like that, and some wonderful South African writers as well about complex trauma, and about how complex trauma is, about how people are exposed. We as South Africans are exposed. We, not just, we, the, the poor people are mostly exposed. Continuous trauma, on, 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 the drip mechanism. Now you can't be diagnosed with PTSD if you have continuous trauma, because they say it is an event. 
please. That study that I sent there, okay, that I showed earlier about with, with witnessing, that was the criteria, an event. Well, show me the people of an event in their lives. <coughs> Developmental trauma. I had studied dissociation. I didn't know what happened until I had it that day. Right up there, looking down. Watched me. Watched Michelle come into the room. Watched the paramedics. Watched me get up and try and hit the paramedics. <laughs> Re-traumatization. Triggers, 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 triggers. We're going to get to that under resilience. And masking trauma. Oh, and it goes on in that masking trauma of, you know, the victim, survivor, thriver thing? The victim will always mask their trauma. Always, 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 always. And, and, and until they are ready to take the mask off, then we can get it to them. And some more. I did it on social trust. I looked at social trust in this country, moral injury, betrayal, trauma, soul repair, as I've talked about. Stigma! Stigma is the very worst thing in mental health. I go out there and there are people and they say, yo, oh, you're in the way. I, I say, I'm nuts. I'm nuts. Come. I'm nuts. I'm nuts. We're all nuts. Every bloody one of us is nuts. <laughs> <coughs> there's a victor, survivor, and thriver in that chapter. You can go through these chapters, read what it is, take out what you want. It's all free. It's all online. Done it there. Social trust, social capital. Oh, this is huge. This is, I, if you understand this, this, uh, Social capital, why our social capital in this country has crumbled, why, why we cannot reach the dream of a rainbow nation and the dream of Mandela and the dream of all so many of us because our social capital has broken down and it's, the core of it is trauma. At the core of this is trauma. Social trust, social justice, social repression, trust in psychology. And we're continuing that today. We're continuing that today, by the way. We're continuing that today. We're just going on repeating history. We've done it to ourselves for 175 years in this country. And I love this country. I love it so much. I really do. <coughs> so, another whole section there. And then, oh, uh, social trust ones. Oh, no, sorry, that was an additional slide somehow. Oh, okay. Now, I suddenly realized, you know, I actually don't know much about the technical sides of these things. So I better go and study that too. So, I studied mental health terminology and I studied diagnostics and I studied all sorts of things. And I studied the DSM. And it's a fraud. When the first DSM was produced in the 1980s, it was great intention. I think it was about 250, something like that. Things that you could be classified nuts about. In DSM-5, they're 2,650. We've got 10 times nuttier. <laughs> but we haven't. Because they're all written by pharmaceutical companies. They're all written by Big Pharma. If you follow the story, if you understand the story, I mean, the people who, who the, the APA, the American Psychiatric Association, because there's two APA, the American Psychology Association, American Psychiatric Association, these people should be in jail. They should be in jail. They've accepted bribes and bribes and bribes from the pharmaceutical companies. When you've been down this route and you've been down to a thing, you, 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 you'll know why I'm an activist and many others. The Rockefeller Foundation, the Dale Carnegie Foundation, the, the, these oligarchies, these, these monopolists. They're not capitalists, they're monopolists. Okay? That started the pharmaceutical industry out of petroleum, and that's where it is. And that most of these drugs, when you look at the placebo effects, some of them, it's even more important. And how they bribe them through the FDA. And the FDA, the CPC, and the EPA, they're all revolving doors. doors. It's uh, people come from business, and they become chairman, and they go out and go back into business. All revolving doors. They're not independent bodies. Do you know what's happening right now? Do you know the autism story that's been poo-pooed? That, that um, in vaccinations cause autism. And it was squashed because the CPC said, Center for, Center for Disease Control, CDC, sorry, CDC. No, 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 no studies. And then a whistleblower came up and he said, that's rubbish. I've been destroying evidence, but I've been keeping it on the side. He was inside the CDC. And yes, there's a direct link between mercury in these things. And you know that on some of these things, they use uh, deliberately diseased African green monkey cells. Oh, all, I, I go down very great different paths. I, I, I don't like big pharma. Although I take some drugs, I need to for my heart. Robbie, I'm off it. I'm no longer on the serotonin. I'm off. 
I'm taking vitamin B6. I'm taking Ginny. She's helping me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm off. I had a few bad days, but I'm off. I looked at the ICD, who are desperately trying to do their own thing, but they're just going in circles. And then some South African last, last things, I looked at some of that. But if you want to get into some technical stuff, <coughs> human rights and healthcare. Oh, now I, know, so now I need to know about human rights. I'm flipping hell. Now I need to know about because I knew nothing about human rights. I didn't know what my rights were. <coughs> and there is a chapter in here that you should read. And it's called The Forgotten Truth, Trauma, the Consequences of Gross Human Rights Violations. The medical establishment of this country got off extremely lightly. Extremely lightly. The psychiatrists and psychologists ducked the truth and reason by any means possible. They reformed themselves using the same bank accounts, etc., into a new organization, okay? <coughs> so it's SASOP. Do you know SASOP did not have a black executive member until last year, 2016? And that's because they had the World Conference. So they plucked some obscure psychiatrist out of Soviet and said, You're making a chairman. I do not like these people. I do not like what they are doing. They are so elitist. They will not speak. They will not do anything, whatever. And they're blocking everything. SESOP and uh, SISA are coming for a lot of stinging criticism from you. I'm sorry, it's on another slide. I think. <coughs> Human rights and health care. It's, it's on this thing. Um, causes of mental health. I, I, I looked at all of that because I needed to go back. <coughs> this was a big kick on me. True trauma and coexistent health challenges. Terms, comorbidity and co-occurring, mental health in general, the centrality of trauma, HIV, AIDS, substance abuse, and poverty, and the perpetuation of poverty in this country. How does a poor person get out of poverty? When they're traumatized every day, they have developmental problems as children and neurological problems, so their learning skills are impaired. How do, they get, how do we get these people out if we don't do something about it? So yes. I proved, I did not prove the null hypothesis in my studies. I did not prove it. Consist, coexistent healthcare challenges that cannot be solved in the absence of trauma care. Poverty is a health issue. <coughs> Substance abuse, a health issue. HIV, AIDS, a health issue. And so is violence and crime. We will not solve these problems unless we address the trauma. So, oh, okay, so now I've had one look at it. By this stage in my life, I'm a pretty shattered guy. I mean, I just say, oh, this is all flipping so scary. Much bigger than what I need to do, to do. So, you see, my eyes were big and wide then. I wasn't looking through one eye anymore. But close one eye, this, close another eye, that. I love this picture. And at the end, <coughs> no, I need to have another look at through another eye. Remember that slide I put up about the Minister of Health, etc., etc., etc. Now, back in 2012, we did not know what Essie de Mene. Does anybody not know what Essie de Mene is? <coughs> the Gauteng uh, uh, Healthcare Department decided to move a vast number of patients, I forget the number, out of psychiatric facilities <laughs> into community. Unfortunately, unfortunately, they moved it through a single organization that had absolutely no experience in doing this. Okay, who then farmed it off to NGOs who had absolutely no experience to do this. South Africa's top scientists in, in, in trauma left because most of our great scientists in trauma left, have left, left the country in the 70s. Fantastic people, unbelievable thinkers, like South Africans really have been over the years. I mean, when I started to campaign, I wrote three articles that, that, that uh, Biz News actually published for me for Christmas. And I wrote to him and he said, you know, but this idea of Trissy is yours. We don't want Essie Domenis happening. Well, for goodness sake, what do you think I'm trying to put an organization like Trissy together for? <sighs> Essie Domeni happened. So that is the risk factor that is putting there. But you will try to learn. Okay. <coughs> I found a thing called trauma-informed care. Anybody know about trauma-informed care? You don't. It's tragic. Aussies, again, the first. The first, they came out punching. They came out punching. They actually squashed the psychiatry associates. They squashed everybody else. The woman there, Kathy Kesselman, Dr. Kathy Kesselman, who must have... Yes! 
big cojones. She, I mean, she really was fantastic. But she got some of the top scientists to back her. And she changed all the whole thing and they learned about trauma-informed care. Now, trauma-informed care, I can spend two days seminar on, okay, so I can't. But it, that will tell you all about trauma-informed care, what it is, how it is, how it is, whatever, whatever, and how we can put... And trauma-informed care can be put into every single <coughs> element. It, it takes account of, of, of social justice, it takes about education, it takes account of all of these different things. It certainly takes account of how to deal with people that are nuts. So yes, that's what I'm saying. It, 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 fit, it fits trauma-informed care is all there and whatever and whatever. So the concept, the solution in trauma-informed care is absolutely fantastic. But the one thing that I did learn is SAMHSA and the South African uh, mental, uh, mental Health and Drug Abuse or whatever it is, Substance and Mental Health thing in the United States. Very, very big. Very big. They, they then rushed in and published trauma-informed guidelines. These are free to us. They're free. And they'll send people here to help train us. And then Canada. Canada's the third country that's also come in on this. And then Israel has actually quite a bit of this going on. And there are a couple of other countries. The Brits are a bit far behind. But you know, the Brits, the Brits we're, we're, we're not traumatized. Yeah, we just bugger little boys around the corner. <laughs> and then I learned about behavioral health. And, I, and, and to me, our structure in South Africa is so wrong. So wrong. This is our pr integrated primary care. I'm going to take you through what behavioral health risk. And I think the best way to sum up behavioral health is that mental health is the biology of the individual. That's what the psychiatrists say is mental health, because that's the DSM. Do you notice the courts don't quote the DSM anymore? Huh? They don't. It's been so ridiculous. If you if you were watching Oscar's trial, the DSM clearly now started to bring DSM, and then. Somebody sent him a note, and then the next day he didn't introduce it. <laughs> no, he didn't. He didn't. Because you can slay it. You can absolutely slay it. It's a money-making racket. <coughs> but behavioral health consists of all of these things. It's biological and it's environmental. It involves trauma-informed care. It looks at emotions and habits and behaviors. It's relational. We not, don't have trauma in isolation. We have trauma in relation to people, our relationships. For every person with PTSD, there are five people affected. Their families, at least. Complex trauma with toxic stress. It's inclusive. It's far more stigmatizing because they actually treat the customer, not the system. Risks and protective factors. It looks at risks and protective factors. How you integrate them into the schools, into the hospitals, into things. And you put those risks and protective factors in. Mental health does not consider that for one minute. <coughs> it's highly integrative with primary and health care. And this is all being done. This is all being done. This is not me inventing the wheel. Incremental skills deployment. You don't have to be a psychologist to help people. Body, mind, and spirit, it covers the whole lot. So, here is my thing about, I think, that South Africa should have a dream of moving towards. Our health system culture must, first of all, be based on human rights. I knew nothing about human rights, until, but human rights is right. We need human rights. Public health care. But our public health care must be underpinned but primary and behavioral health and mental health care must be below it. It must feed in. But the whole behavioral health care system, now there's a lot to talk about in that, and I've done a whole structure on it. So, but now I need to talk to you about resilience. You said 45 minutes. How am I going to go on a long 45 minutes to an hour. Just gone over. Give me another 10 minutes, please. Resilience. I had to look it through as another thing, resilience. But let me tell you about resilience. One thing interesting about resilience, both resilience and trauma theory had their origins in the 19th century. Okay? And then came along a whole lot of people who wanted to control stuff and stamp them both out. Okay? They both went into things and they re-emerged back in the 1970s. Now, I don't know if you can read that there, but I, I see it as an inverted graph. On, 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 on the macro scale, 
resilience is about ecology. About, about, that's where all the big studies are being done, about the ecology of our planet. Okay? But what's happening now is it's being channeled, and more people are becoming far more modular about resilience and studying resilience at a modular level. Whereas in, a, in, in thing, it was biology, okay, it was at the greater level of thing, and now we're becoming far more focused on behavioral issues. Okay? So I'm going to make a few statements. Resilience, the ability to bounce back. It's marketing bullshit. It does not exist. Because what it says to you is that you and you are, you are alone. You're not alone. You're never alone. We, work, we, we are cultural creatures. We are societal creatures. Ability to bounce back. It's got nothing to do with that. And you will never be the same. You will never be the same when you have a traumatized thing. Nothing. Nothing's changed. So that, I, I, and I actually read a number of case studies where people were sued for putting up programs and teaching people how to bounce back, and they didn't bounce back. Yeah. Yeah. Resilience is positive. Trauma is negative. That's nonsense. It's not a polarization. It's absolute nonsense. Take the kid that grows up without a family in the Cape Flats. He learns to be incredibly resilient, and he joins a gang. And gangs are one of those resilient things you can get. He learns a whole new line of resilience. Resilience. And he kills people as part of his rituals and maims them and steals them, whatever. Resilience is not necessarily positive. And trauma is negative. Well, I said to you, there's parts of trauma, trust of stress we need in life. We need a certain amount of stress in our lives anyway. So. Then, <coughs> resilience is the antidote for trauma. It's way off the mark. You cannot have trauma and then be taught resilience and therefore, because all you'll do is create masking behaviors, in my opinion. What you can do is receive help for your trauma and then to learn some resilient skills to carry those forward. That's a completely different way of thinking about it. But here's the big thing about resilience. Oh, sorry. So I, I, I've written a number of chapters about, about, thing, about resilience, which I, we're not going to get onto there. Okay, and then, where's my slide? Resilience and trauma. Oh. I believe that you've got to look at, at resilience and trauma. And I found this lovely picture. These are two additional lenses over the camera lens. And that's a resilience lens, that's a trauma lens, that's a life lens. So you've got to look at it through each one alone, and then you've got to put them together and chop them around and change them around if you're going to actually find the solution to this. <coughs> this is the truth about resilience, that resilience systems can and probably do remain traumatized. But to be traumatized, not the cape. The, all, all, all these terrible fires that they say are arsonists are starting. But then, literally, the, the Cape Mountain does need to burn because it needs to be traumatized in order to revitalize. It's, it's the ecology of the system. But it remains the systems. And I believe, somewhere along the line, that the key... So what is the magic key to understanding resilience in the concepts of trauma and in mental health? Is resilience in the absence of a system. An idea, good or bad, indifferent, can be extremely resilient, but it has no system. It might have been evolved from a system, and it might give out systems as a result of that idea, but an idea, idea has no system, but it can be extremely resilient. Love, love has no system. You can explain it biologically if you want to, but I'm telling you, I can't explain why love biologically for Jenny. I can't. It's just, that isn't a possibility. Love of a mother to a child. There's no system involved in that, or the absence of love, as we've seen. The absence of love. Hate. That one word you're not allowed to speak about in South Africa. You're not allowed to speak about hate in South Africa. Generation, the whole Western world's terrible about speaking about hate. When a mother is cornered in danger with her child, a little, I told you, Jin, five foot two Jin, okay? She was cornered with her child. She'd rip the shreds out of a giant man who tried to come and do that. It's pure hate. I, I've watched some very, very interesting stuff by Indian yogis and people like her who understand the purity of the, of the emotion, hate. But hate, hate has no system. And I believe that the answer isn't there. And I haven't found the answer. I don't know it. And I'm dying to find somebody who who really works in the field of resilience, who wants to discuss it with me. <coughs> but I'm going to tell you that out of this, I'm just very briefly, I'll just put up two examples. I've shared some of this with Suzanne. 
There are wonderful things that are coming out of the whole ACES group, the whole behavioral health group, the whole trauma-informed care people, things, and then also involving resilience. They've got, they've got stuff called the Community Resilience Cookbook. It's beautifully done. It's beautifully written about how you build community resilience. They've got these programs. They want to share them. They have international donors funding them. The donors possibly could come in with us. And then this thing, Resilience Trumps Aces. They took a school, <coughs> a typical school sort of, I don't know, just, yeah, you know, the kids are causing cock and the teachers are lazy and, uh, and I put a headmaster in there and he was desperate and he really wanted to do something. And they put this program in. And, 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 and they, they got these people in and whatever, and it's absolutely, they did, the, did it all totally scientifically and how they changed it. And it's a card game. It's a card game about resilience. And they taught the kids how to play the card game, except that in the second year, the kids started to teach them how to play new card games with the same resilience packs. <laughs> and the kids took the resilience packs home and taught their parents. And their parents said, my word, this is unbelievable. And they taught them all about the stuff, okay, that they needed to be a community, that... The parents couldn't just shove the kids into the school and expect the teachers to cope. And the teachers couldn't just send the children home, expect the parents to cope. They had to understand what was going on in their school. Absenteeism came right down. Mark's grades improved. It's all been scientifically done. It's another thing I'd love to bring to this country, into our education system. So finally then, I need to get on to, very quickly, on to Trissy. I'm going to skip that slide. That slide. Customer, now you can't see this, okay? But there are four things. I believe that I've identified all I think people are customers that, that could be required, um, uh, that would be there. And that, so I have a four legged table trauma informed care, behavioral health care, customer care, and resilience informed care for my things that, that I've rested Trissy on in its explanation. Now I can't keep telling you, but I, I, have, I have written it. That's the Trissy organization, Trissy the domain. Social impact statements are written, solutions focused, matrix management is the chosen system to run it, which is the same thing as the World Health Organization has brought in because of this doctor from the Far East and whatever who, who's got it all jacked up and, uh, and how well it's working within the thing, matrix system. I'm not going to go through it all. We don't have it. And I've covered how to, how to. And I'm not going to go through those things, but it fits and integrates into my model there. And it's on a matrix system that that expands, but I don't have the time. But I've also gone into how you should finance this. Whew. I'm not an expert in this stuff. I'm desperate to find somebody who's going to help me, who knows about money. But I found impact investing and how it's taking off overseas. Impact investing. And that says uh, um, uh, no returns, that's high returns, low impact, high impact. And they're looking, impact investors are looking for philanthropy in that area. They are not looking for social venture capital. That means returns on. Although, I, if I take my the Aces card game and we get checkers and Waltons and people to sponsor it, there's incoming money as well. That's social venture capital. But this they want to make on the, on the thing. So we know that we, we thought about the, oh, oh, this is in the um, Southern government did identify in 2012 that 29 billion rand is lost through absenteeism and through mental health. Mental health, but they don't recognize that trauma is at the core of mental health. And in fact, a national mental health development plan is absolutely outstanding document, except for one thing. It does not mention trauma. It talks about all the coexistence and the what, but it doesn't mention trauma. You know, I know why. I know why. I know why they kept it out of there, because nobody's done any work on it in this country. And violence against women. I, I, how many billions of rands it costs us annually is trauma is just thing. So, and that doesn't fit in very carefully. A national mental health policy framework. I can tell you the models are there. It fits in beautifully with all of that. It beautifully fits in with all of the different levels. This says quantity of services needed, costs, lower costs. Trauma-informed care fits in beautifully here. The whole thing, Trissy and Hard organization is there. And then finally, so what do you go ahead? Well, I love this statement. The only difference between stumbling blocks and stepping stones is the way in which we use them. I love that. I absolutely love that. I don't think you go and rush in there and you form a trissy and spend a billion rand on it. Some, some bugger will take a cut of that anyway. So I don't think that you should do that. I think that what you should do, I, I would love to see a working team put together. I reckon it costs 15 to 20 million over three years. That's a puffling amount in terms of the billions that have been lost. And um, I've identified a whole thing about how, what that would give you over three years. 
the government and official healthcare body endorsement. It needs, Tristy cannot exist without government endorsement. Cannot, but not control. It needs to be independent, it needs to have independent thinking. I see it as an organization not that does, but that captures and disseminates. As an organization that comes in, that helps coordinate all our disparate efforts. All right, our social workers, oh my goodness, our poor social workers in this country, they've got no voice, they've got nothing. Where they can come, how they can get information. So it's a home, uh, a, 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 a founded, it should be homed in an academic institution. It's an international TI expert leader. I think we need to bring in somebody from the outside. By the way, I'm not asking to be part of this. I'm far too nuts to actually be part of any organization. <laughs> <coughs> Four of the five dedicated young South Africans members like Lolon, Lolon, Lolon Schwabo. Lolon Nwabo. Nelly? No, no. No, no. No, no. Nwabo. I'll try it again. Okay, a virtual environment to appropriate celebrity experts. You don't have to employ all those people. You have a core. Then you go when you want to bring in the various experts. You bring them in. That's how modern organisations are formed today. You don't hire all the staff you need. You hire them partially. Okay, abundant international cooperation. I can tell you they are just waiting. As long as it had government and all the other bodies endorsing it, it would be fine. Uh, so for intermen then that, that emergent you after that they need to come up with a, the next three year plan of how you're going to actually implement and put this together that's only six years we've already wasted six years since 2012 well almost okay and not done anything okay the CIs have funding for the development program I, I believe we can find funding for they find it but that group you need some clever people that I don't know these auditing firms though it's quite funny these auditing firms, oh no, we've got the KPMG report, we've got the Price Waterhouse report, we've got, and then you find out the Price Waterhouse and KPMG have been involved in the fraud in the first place. But I don't know, I mean, it just gets me. A beginning of the necessary enthusiasm and motivation from our overstretched medical and social services, and that's it. So, folks, that's me, and I say thank you. Take care, because people need people like you, and you need yourselves. <laughs>